I'd like to ask you to welcome Bob to Chicago and the Economic Club of Chicago. Well, thank you very much, John, for that very generous introduction. And it is always a pleasure to come back to Chicago. Uh, I was flying on a, on a flight on Wednesday night, a United flight from Washington. And the plane, I flipped open the window at uh, five minutes after five. And it was before the snowstorm. Beautiful sunset. And the plane went over the southern end of Lake Michigan. I looked down, and there was the Whiting Refinery, which is one of our largest investments in the world. And then the plane curved around and came towards uh, the city and just flew north of the big buildings up to Kennedy and landed in O'Hare. And it just reminded me what a remarkable city Chicago is with the amber lights at night. And this, uh, it's a great city in the world. So it is truly great to be back. Thank you. Thank you. When I, uh, when I started my energy career, as John said, in 1979, a couple of blocks away from here, I never imagined I would be back one day representing the company in this very prestigious forum. So it's an honor to be here. Thank you, John. And as John noted, BP and Amoco and the energy industry has seen enormous changes in recent decades. But one thing that hasn't changed is the importance of the Chicago area to BP. Chicago land is home to many of our vital businesses. We have our integrated trading and supply business, which is now housed in the old Merck building. Also downtown is our entire east of Rockies fuels value chain headquarters, which includes, among other things, our sales and marketing activities, which handle uh, about 9,500 branded gas stations fueling 3 million customers from Florida to Minnesota to New York. Also in the area is AirBP, which provides aviation fuel at really all major U.S. airports, including 1,000 flights a day from O'Hare. BP America Pipelines is run out of Chicago, and our United uh, Refining and Fuels Research and Development Units are in the area as well. And our Americas Business Service Center supports our refining and marketing businesses, and all of the Americas are located here. And then just across the state line in Indiana, we're on track to complete a multi-billion dollar modernization program of a place called the Whiting Refinery. Uh, it's one of the largest investments this area has ever seen, and it is the largest industrial project in Indiana's history. All told, our operations provide jobs here in the area for 13,000 employees and contractors in Illinois and northern Indiana. Now, we are deeply committed to the region and to the United States. So let me tell you a few things that you might not know about the company that was formerly known as British Petroleum. While our corporate headquarters are in London, our American roots go considerably deeper than our British ones in some ways. ARCO, our oldest heritage component, was founded as the Atlantic Petroleum Storage Company in Pennsylvania in 1866. Then the Standard Oil Company was incorporated in Ohio four years after that, and the company uh, called Standard Oil of Indiana, which became Amoco, was founded in 1889. And all of this came before a man named William Knox Darcy founded the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, which eventually became BP in 1909. So in spite of that long storied history, there were those in 2010 who questioned our willingness and ability to maintain our commitment to the United States. They said we would have to rebrand ourselves, reduce our presence here, and even exit the U.S. market altogether. None of those options would have been acceptable to us. That would have meant abandoning tens of thousands of employees and retirees who represent generations of experience, innovation, and resilience. For BP, that would have been a big mistake a mistake that would have affected people across the United States who count on us for secure and reliable energy supplies. Since 2006, BP has invested more than $50 billion in the U.S. energy development, nearly twice as much as our nearest competitor, and, more, and that is more than BP invests in any other country. Nearly 30% of our employees are based in the U.S. 
again, more than in any other country. And nearly 40% of our shareholders are here as well. If my first act as BP's first American chief executive had been to walk away from the United States, I would have felt like I was walking away not only from the past, but a key component of our future. So while we are a global company, we are also very much an American company. And we have every intention of staying that way. Mm. Mm. Nearly two years ago, that American heritage and the investment was tested to the core. The Deepwater Horizon accident and oil spill took 11 lives, injured dozens more, and disrupted the livelihood of thousands of people in the Gulf Coast region. There were fishermen and their families, people in the tourism industry, and residents who had their way of life changed suddenly. From the outset, we believed it was important to step up and work with government officials and others to address the needs of those people. At the same time, however, our credit situation became increasingly difficult. Shareholders fled, our reputation was in tatters. We had experienced a massive loss of public trust. Trust is a subject I've been thinking about a great deal recently. People say money makes the world go round, according to the old saying, but I'm not sure that's really true. More and more, the key element seems to be trust in varying ways. I think we all live on trust. We trust that airline pilots will deliver us safely to our destinations. We trust that the goods and services we buy will work properly. We trust that bankers and brokers will handle our money responsibly. And we trust those that run complex industrial operations, such as a chemical plant, or a refinery, or a nuclear power plant, oil rigs, will maintain the risks involved. Yet over the last two decades, we've seen this critical commodity called trust eroded in many, many ways. The last decade has seen a loss of confidence in major institutions almost across the board. That's governments, banks, the media, and even religious and sports organizations. Every year, the Gallup organization asks Americans how they trust various institutions. And out of the 16 institutions surveyed most recently, only three, which was military, small business, and police, enjoy the trust of the majority of Americans. But it wasn't much comfort to know that we were not alone in our dramatic loss of public trust. So we had to re-earn it. So how do you respond to a loss of trust? There is no off-the-shelf plan because the reasons for the loss of trust differ in each case. So I can only speak about BP today, and today I want to give you some sense of progress on our quest to earn back trust. The effort has three parts. I call them the three R's, which is respond, reinforce, and restore. And I'm going to take each one of these in turn. So starting with Respond, on that morning in April 2010, I was getting ready for a day in a hotel room in India. I'd been appointed to head BP's Asia operations and switched on the TV to catch the news. Unfortunately, BP was the news of the day, as it would be every day for the next six months. My role quickly changed. I was asked to head up the response to what became one of the worst maritime spills in history. For me, it wasn't just a job, it was a very personal mission. Before moving to Chicago, as John mentioned, I grew up in Mississippi. I spent summers on the Gulf Coast. It was very familiar to me and the people involved. I knew personally, and it hit home. So the challenge we faced at BP was multifaceted and incredibly complex. First, most critical was the engineering challenge because we had to stop the flow of oil from a well 5,000 feet below the sea with a mile of twisted and bent pipe above it and an uncertain condition below that. So our engineers worked alongside specialists from other companies, from the government, the military, academia, and they worked day and night to find a way. After several failed attempts using remotely operated vehicles that are basically robotic submarines, we were finally able to stop the flow of oil on July 15th using something called a capping stack. And after cementing the well in early August, we continued drilling relief wells just in case to intercept and permanently seal it. We succeeded on September 19th after 153 days of round-the-clock work. 
Now, I think that was a remarkable engineering feat because it required hitting a target the size of a dinner plate, three and a half miles below the water's surface in the dark. At the same time, up on the surface, we faced a daunting logistical challenge. So working with the U.S. government, our response involved at its peak around 48,000 people, 6,000 ships and over 100 aircraft, 13 and a half million feet of boom. And despite our best efforts, some oil did reach the shore. In all, 635 miles of shoreline required some degree of cleaning. So 20 months later, while we're still monitoring for the occasional tar ball and responding as necessary, I am pleased to report we're down to just several miles of active cleanup on the Gulf. Also, federal and state trustees recently selected the first early environmental restoration projects for which BP has committed up to a billion dollars. The financial challenge we face cannot be overstated. Despite our deep resource and valuable assets, the uncertainty we face caused some banks to stop trading with us and extending credit. Our stock price plummeted more than 50 percent. Nevertheless, I believe we stepped up. We waived the $75 million statutory liability cap of the Oil Spill Pollution Act of 1990. We established a $20 billion trust to assure the American public that funds would be available for economic and environmental restoration. We've spent more than $21 billion on the response, cleanup, and claims so far. We have divested $23 billion of assets globally. And even though testing today shows beaches and waters and seafood are safe, we're making up to $500 million available for the next decade to fund scientific research in the Gulf ecosystem. Fortunately, we have recently got some help. Two of our partners and two of our contractors have now contributed to the effort, and we've called on others to step up and meet their obligations. Now, communicating with our employees, the government, local residents, and the general public was a significant challenge. The circumstances were chaotic, events changed quickly, and rumors ran wild. Under the direction of the Coast Guard and in concert with other government agencies, we participated in the Unified Command, which conducted daily updates on the response from Louisiana. In Houston, daily technical briefings were provided on our efforts to cap the well. We even invited reporters into the command center where our engineers were working to stop the leak. And then there was a the challenge of responding to multiple government investigations and close scrutiny from mayors, governors, and federal officials, including the president himself, all while we were trying to respond to the accident. Even as we were coping with all this, we still had a global company to run. Safety and risk management had always been at the forefront of our operations, but in light of what had happened, we committed to reinforce our safety and risk management procedures globally everywhere. And that's the second R I want to address, uh, reinforce. From the outset, BP made it clear we would cooperate with all official investigations, and we immediately launched our own investigation. Its findings are posted on our website less than five minutes, five months later, concluded it was a very complex accident involving multiple causes and multiple parties. That is the conclusion that seems to be substantially reported by all subsequent official investigations. We knew we had a responsibility to embed the lessons from this accident across BP worldwide. We had to advance and continuously improve our safety and operations based on that knowledge. So first, we created a powerful new safety and operational risk organization whose head reports directly to me, sits on my leadership team as does Lamar McKay, head of BP America, who's here today with us. This new organization includes hundreds of experts deployed across our operating businesses to guide, advise, and if necessary, intervene. We have shut down platforms and operations to make the necessary upgrades around the world, and we have rejected rigs from contractors that feel to meet our new enhanced requirements. We've added to our board of directors retired Admiral Frank or Skip Bowman, former head of the U.S. Nuclear Navy, an organization renowned for its safety consciousness. 
In the Gulf of Mexico, we have instituted voluntary new drilling standards that exceed federal requirements. And to give you an example, we will not drill a well from a dynamically positioned rig, which means it's not anchored, unless something called the blowout preventer has at least two sets of blind shear rams and a casing shear ram. It's a bit technical, but it's really important. Uh, this provides increased redundancy in the event of an accident or any emergency. In Houston, the same engineers who capped the Macondo well designed and built another containment cap that can be deployed worldwide in a matter of days, if necessary. We're also sharing what we learned from the incident with government regulators, industry experts, and academics worldwide. We've had more than 100 speaking engagements around the subject in more than 25 countries, and the number grows daily. And even though some of our findings could have been of competitive advantage to BP, we're sharing them all with our companies and other companies because it's the right thing to do, private companies, national oil companies. It's early yet, but we're heartened that many governments worldwide are recognizing the steps we've taken, both in responding to the spill and reinforcing safety. And last year was really a record year. The more, I've never seen a year like this. Uh, for new acreage access for exploration, with BP being granted more than 70 exploration licenses in 12 countries around the world. And we're back working in the Gulf of Mexico where U.S. regulators have granted us our first drilling permit since the accident. It's a milestone we are proud to have passed. That brings me to my final R, which is restore. And I mean that in restoring American energy security. One of the reasons I'm here in the U.S. is to get a closer look at some of the remarkable things BP is doing in this country, all of which reaffirm our commitment to the United States and its energy security. I spent yesterday at our winding refinery, which is a great example of what I mean. It was built in 1889. It is our oldest facility, and it is still going strong. We want to ensure that it plays a role in the future, so we're investing billions of dollars modernizing it so that it can, among other things, handle crude oils, heavier crude oils like those produced in Canada, and continue to supply the Midwest of the U.S. I've also just been to Alaska last week. It provides an example of how we can use technology to enhance production. When we first started pumping oil from the north slope of Alaska in the late 1970s, we and our partners thought it would only last about 20 years. But through the use of techniques such as horizontal drilling, gas and water injection, we are more than a decade beyond that now. And we're still producing there and we are still investing there and it's important for the United States. I'm also very proud of our alternative energy business, in which we've invested $7 billion since 2005. $4 billion of that $7 billion has been spent here in the U.S., where we're focusing on wind power and advanced biofuels. There is evidence, this should be evidence, that all of these and other efforts are paying off, not just for BP, but also the American, the American energy need for energy security. The Energy Department tells us that U.S. oil imports have fallen by a third, from 12.5 million barrels per day in 2005, now down to only 8.5 million barrels per day in 2011. Now, the sluggish economy and the higher energy prices are part of the reason for the decline, but it's also due to increased domestic oil and gas production, more fuel-efficient cars, and the use of biofuels. While U.S. demand is expected to be flat or declining, we estimate world energy demand will soar some 40% over the next 20 years. That is the equivalent of adding another United States and another China to existing consumption in the world. Now, meeting demand on that scale is going to require a very strong and diverse and versatile industry, one that produces all forms of energy, fossil fuels as well as alternatives. The fastest growing fossil fuel is expected to be natural gas. And that's great news for the U.S. because we have a vast domestic supply and the technology available to access it. It typically burns much more cleanly and efficiently than coal with only about half the emissions. So if, if we can use gas to displace older coal-fired 
power generation, that would be a huge step forward for both efficiency and sustainability. As for oil, we still need to find plenty of it. Next week, BP is set to publish its, its energy outlook to 2030 again, the projection of long-term energy trends. An early look shows that even with alternatives and natural gas, 87% of U.S. transportation fuel will still be oil-based in two decades. So where will that come from? I already mentioned enhanced recovery, such as we're doing in Alaska, but that only takes it so far. Finding the rest will require exploration, and the world's remaining accessible oil reserves are located at the frontiers. The Arctic, the Canadian oil sands, and yes, the deep water, like the Gulf of Mexico. And that is why BP chose not to abandon the deep water after 2010. To give you a sense of when I started working in the company, 80% of the world's resources were either owned or managed in some ways controlled by a group called the Seven Sisters, seven big oil companies. Today, that number is only 8% gives you some perspective of why the big oil companies that you think of control less than you think and why we have to work in the difficult places of the world, the deep waters, the arctics, and in difficult environments. Developing those resources will require the services of many smart, skilled, motivated people. Indeed, the potential of energy as a source of jobs deserves the attention of all of this year's presidential candidates. The Wall Street Journal recently did an analysis of figures provided by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and it found that the number of U.S. oil and gas jobs has increased some 80% to 440,000 people since 2003. In fact, oil and gas account for a remarkable one in five private sector jobs created during the period. And so BP is part of that. BP is America's second largest producer of oil and gas, and as I mentioned, its largest energy investor. Over the last five years, BP's reinvestment in the U.S. has substantially exceeded the profits we earned here. That translates into jobs for Americans. We employ more than 23,000 people directly in the U.S., nearly 30 percent of our global workforce. And counting our U.S. supply chain, nearly a quarter of a million jobs depend on BP activities. And it isn't only jobs. BP is part of the American community. In 2011, BP America spent over $30 million supporting foundations, schools, cultural institutions, community projects across the country. We've spent that much alone in Chicago over the last five years in support of everything from the Art Institute to the Museum of Science and Industry, from the Children's Museum to Chicago United. We're an official partner of the U.S. Olympic Committee and Team USA as they prepare to send American athletes to this summer's London Olympic and Paralympic Games. So looking ahead, I'm optimistic that our company and our industry can meet the energy challenges I've outlined. It is a big challenge. Since I started working for Amoco in 79, the energy industry has actually produced more oil than was known to exist in the world at that time. And today's oil reserves have actually grown twice the size that they were back then. That kind of success can only be replicated in the future if public and policy trust makers that the task can be performed safely and responsibly. For BP, the path to re-earning that trust requires these three R's of responding to the spill, reinforcing our company's focus on safety, and helping restore U.S. energy security. It hasn't been easy. Our work is not done. There's still much more to do. It requires continued focus and commitment. But if we stay on course, I am confident we can deliver a safer, stronger BP and regain the trust of the country where our roots are deepest, and I believe our future is brightest. Again, for me, it's great to be back in Chicago, see old friends, and be with you today, and thank you, John. Mm -hmm.